free training on finding meaning in loss. As clinicians, we recognize that grief and loss are so fundamental to our work and an inevitable part of our life for both ourselves and our, cl our clients. So a heartfelt welcome to you for being a part of our community of clinicians and individuals here to gain insight on how to better support others through their experiences of grief and loss. Before we get started, just a few things. So please remember that there's so much information in your portal, uh, including answers to frequently asked questions, including troubleshooting technical issues. So make sure to check that out if you're running into issues, and you can also reach out to our team if you need any help. This is a free training, so there are no strings attached, but if you are a professional wanting to get continuing education for this training, please take advantage of the CE upgrade in the portal. Also, we will have three amazing times to have Q&A with the speaker today. So if you have questions, please post those questions that you have for the speaker. We will get to as many of those as possible um, because our agenda today, we will have a break at around 1030 for 15 minutes and then we'll come back for that Q&A. Then we will break for lunch at around 1250 and go till two central with a 15 minute Q&A right after lunch. And then there will be one more afternoon break around 3.30 Central followed by a final Q&A. So without further ado today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker who is one of the world's foremost experts on healing and loss. His experience with thousands of people on the edge of life and death has taught him secrets to living a happy and fulfilled life. He is the author of six best-selling books. His book that inspired this training is Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. And he has also written The Needs of the Dying, a number one best-selling hospice book, received praise by Saint and Mother Teresa. He co-authored two bestsellers with the legendary Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on Grief and Grieving and Life Lessons. He has worked with Elizabeth Taylor, Jamie Lee Curtis, Marianne Williamson, and more uh, when their loved ones face life uh, challenging illnesses. And he's also worked with the late actors, Anthony Perkins and Michael Landon. His work has been discussed in the LA Times, Business Week, and Life Magazine. And he has been featured on Brene Brown, CNN Crossfire, NBC, Fox, PBS, Dr. Oz, and Entertainment Tonight. He is a contributing writer on Oprah.com, Dr. Oz's ShareCare.com, Anderson Cooper 360, and the Huffington Post. In terms of education, he has a master's degree in healthcare bioethics from Loyola Marymount University, and he did his undergraduate work at University of Southern California and is a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives. He is a certified AMA EPEC, which is the Education for Physicians Trainer, and he is also the founding chairperson for the Hospital Association of Southern California Palliative Care Committee, and has spent the last decade as a C-suite executive in a 650-bed, three-hospital system in Los Angeles County. Everyone, please welcome one of the most trusted and prolific voices in the grief space, David Kessler. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I literally hear all that and I'm like, number one, who are they talking about? And number two, I'm a little like, forgot to tell you that I was president of the ninth grade twice. It took my kids a long time to get that joke. It means I managed to get held back. I'm so grateful to be with you today. It is literally going to be an action packed day. So I'm so glad you're here along for the ride. And I, I have done these for years. I haven't done this one in a while. And I used to do all of these live and it's my, my uh, cadence is always the same. I start out going, I don't have enough to talk about for a full day. And then halfway, I'm like, I don't have enough time. So thank you for coming with me on this ride. It's going to be um, uh, very helpful, I hope. And I'm going to make sure during the Q&A, I really hear what you want and need and talk about that because, you know, we've all had that experience where we've um, heard from a speaker and it's like, oh, we never got our questions answered. And I want to make sure your questions get answered today. 
I'm also at a sitting standing desk. So since it's an all day event, you're going to it's going to look like the wall moves. Just know that's me sitting down or standing up. Just so you know, let me pull my slides up here for you so we can begin. And I'm going to be switching today back and forth from slides. Um, so I'll get those loaded in here. And um, it's going to be very interesting to sort of um, uh, see how the day progresses. And uh, I'm also um, not a slave to the slides. So I'm a big believer in um, you know, going with what comes up. So just know many times things might come up that you're like, oh, I didn't know that was coming. And I always like to add a few things here and there. All right, let me pull my slides up and we're going to begin. And uh, I'll talk you through some of this here. All right, going to share screen. And I don't want to take you to my email. They're challenging for me. I don't want to do that to you. All right, here we go. And let me just do from the beginning. And there you should see. All right. So today, obviously, we're talking about finding meaning. A little bit about my background. My first book, which is almost 30 years ago, I can't believe, is The Needs of the Dying. Um, it is uh, about end of life, palliative care, and uh, I'm so grateful. We're going to talk today a bit about how death and grief interact and how they um, really, the death shapes the grief. That'll be something we'll talk about. I was privileged to write two books with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I just wrote, uh, I just did a video, I just did an audio for a book I did years ago, Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. You can heal your heart. I'll show them to you in a moment. As was mentioned, board certified in healthcare management. I also work with the LAPD as a specialist reserve officer for decades now, and have worked and volunteered on the Red Cross's aviation disaster team and mental health team. That's Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and I years ago. These are the two books that I wrote with her, Life Lessons and on Grief and Grieving. We'll hear more about her and hopefully clear up some myths. This is the one I mentioned. I was so curious about end of life care and who and what you see before you die. I interviewed doctors, nurses, social workers, clergy about their experience about deathbed visions because uh, things like that come up and I don't think we talk about those often enough, those phenomenons that happen at end of life. This is Louise Hay and I years ago, and we did a book called You Can Heal Your Heart. And I love this book that it covers divorce and breakup, and we'll talk about all that too um, today, and pet loss and so many other kinds of losses, betrayal that happen in our life. And I'm at grief.com. That's where you can always find me is... Uh, uh, many, many resources there, free resources, really helpful things. And I'm just going to walk you through some of these resources so that you know about them and we'll get them out of the way and we can get to the content. On grief.com, this is the resource page. Oh my gosh, so many things there. If you've got a client who's had a loved one murdered, a loss of a child, loss of a parent, just wants to know about grief, best and worst things to say, so many videos there and resources. That's on the resource page of grief.com. The other thing is I have uh, online groups that many of your clients are in, and I always appreciate your recommendation called Tender Hearts. It's an online support group. And one of the, the shocking things about it is it's sort of my home base. And I go live there four times a week for clients. And um, we have one-on-one -on -one sessions where I work with people called Heart to Hearts on Wednesday and Thursdays, and everyone else watches because I feel like we find ourselves in each other's stories, and we also find our healing in each other's stories. So I'm a big believer in groups, whether it's my Tender Hearts groups or any groups. I love, love group work. And then on Friday, we do what we call a Friday focus, and we take a topic about grief, anything from guilt and anger, or regrets, just a million topics that we do. 
And then on Monday, the shocking thing we do is we have 25 online groups running simultaneously. simultaneously. And I'm just uh, in awe of the group work that people do there. And so I'll show you just some of these groups so you'll know for a reference if you should have a client. And here's one of the big things. This is for a low monthly fee, but no one's ever turned away for a lack of funds. So if you have a client who can't afford it, they can get into this group. All right, let me. These are literally all the groups we have as of right now. And folks get to go in and choose which group they want to be in and talk about this particular thing. So you can see we've got from death of a child to death of a spouse, death of siblings, death by suicide, poisoning, addiction, uh, fentanyl poisoning, so many different groups, LGBTQ, Black, Latino, faith, afterlife, whatever anyone wants to talk about, we try to have a group for it. And many of you have become certified through our grief educator program. This is my personal program that I teach in. And you can find out information about this at griefeducator.com on your screen. So just know, and we have these programs usually about once a year. Um, so I always like to give folks who are on these lectures a preference. So if you go to there, get on the waiting list so you can get in and have the opportunity to get in next time we do it, which is coming up. Then I have a podcast, of course. These days, everyone has a podcast. It's a 12 series, 12 episode podcast that's really amazing from, not because of me, but because of the people I get to talk to. Everyone from William Shatner, Captain Kirk, about the death of his spouse from addiction, um, to and him arguing with Leonard Nimoy Spock about is she or isn't she a uh, uh, an alcoholic and learning about addiction to Ashley Judd and the you know everything from rape and Harvey Weinstein and her own mother dying just amazing people I got to interview so the podcast is on Spotify you can also find it at grief.com so uh, check that out it's really really powerful. These are also other things you can find. Uh, loss, love, and parenting is forever, uh, is for someone who's had the death of a child. These are free series or free videos, griefsuicide.com to help us work through the horrific death by suicide, as well as loss of a parent. We're gonna be talking about all these topics today. So you're gonna get even more than this, but just to have resources later. And I got to tell you, these are grief cards that Pessy put out years ago. And I hated the idea of cards at first. I was like, I'm an author. I write books, not cards. But people have told me now they get grief brain. And the idea of a card one a day, and many therapists have told me they have a client grab them when they come in and talk about what's on the card. And of course, this is my latest book, Finding Meaning, that we're talking about today. And I'm deeply grateful to the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation and to our family for allowing me to even name a sixth stage um, of grief. So we'll talk more about that. So this came out a few years ago, and I have been secretly working on something around this book with Simon & Schuster's permission and Pessy, and um, uh, here it is. It is a workbook that's coming out in October, and uh, it's already on Amazon to pre-order. So this is a workbook all about the sixth stage. It's literally, I wanted it to be like, if I'm mentoring a therapist and telling them each session what to work on, or I'm working with someone in grief, I wanted people to really have a hands-on experience of how to excavate the pain, how to excavate the pain and then discover meaning underneath it. So I'm excited that's coming up. Let's dive in first now to the five stages of grief, because I think there's so many myths. If you're like, oh my gosh, I love those stages or haven't those stages been disproven, we're going to talk about them real quick. But I do want to. Um, share a video 
of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross just for you to sort of see who this is and get an impact of her. And then I'm going to sort of tell you where we have come with how the stages often sit in our society today and why they're still relevant and the myths about them. So lots of stuff around that. Let me pull up my media player. My sound is on. You might want to grab your volume button just to make sure you can turn this up if you need to. All right, here we go. You'll see this is quite an old clip, but it gives you a, a little sense of who she is. Yeah. Well, really what I wanted to, 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 one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show, I don't know about you guys, I've said this several times this season already, is I, I think the purpose of death is to remind you how to live, number one. And I think that, that's certainly one of the purposes, and I think that for all of us who are, you know, grieved over Princess Diana, for those of us who are in, you know, my age range and otherwise, I think it, it was a reminder that nothing is promised life is not promised to us and to think about how you want to live your life in the moment every day and i i wanted to talk to somebody who knows a whole lot about that the inventor the creator actually of the hospice movement elizabeth kubler ross and um she was in preparation for dying herself so the death and dying lady was getting ready to die but i went out to arizona to talk to her and found out that she's not so keen on dying right now <laughs> <laughs> She's not so keen on dying right now. I walked in expecting to find her, like, dying. And uh, she said, well, she's kind of iffy about it right now. Take a look. If you've seen someone you love go to a hospice, or maybe you've read a book about how to cope with death, you have this woman to thank. She is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and if her name is not familiar to you, her work surely is. Born the smallest of triplets in Switzerland, Elizabeth began her life with a strong will and fierce determination to forge her own identity. It was in American hospitals that Elizabeth, now a doctor, would find her true calling. She noticed that dying patients had been set aside, rarely spoken to, but she insisted they be heard. So they can die with peace and without fear and without anguish. Her legendary book, On Death and Dying, would be published, becoming a classic text. In it, Elizabeth identified what she called the five stages of death, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. After patients told her about their near-death experiences, her research took a new turn towards spirituality and mysticism. What was it that happened after you die? She would head out on the talk show circuit. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler. That's when I first met her. She appeared with me on a show called People Are Talking in Baltimore in 1980. The key to it, right? Yes. To accepting death, to live without fear and, and guilt, guilt so that you'll be able to accept it. Fear How do you do guilt, that? Fear and guilt are the only enemies of man. Today, she's 71 years old, debilitated by a series of strokes. In a bit of poetic irony, the woman referred to as the death and dying lady now finds herself at the end of her life. Recently, I went to Arizona to talk to Elizabeth again. Great to see you after all these years. Do you remember? You yes. have the big afro. A big That's afro. Like a member. Big afro. Yeah. Elizabeth yeah. says yeah. she's ready to die, but she's not going gently. She's as <laughs> feisty and opinionated as ever. And from this Swiss country doctor's lifelong research on death and dying, we can all take away lessons about living. Yeah. Well, really, what so I wanted to, to, to wanna wanted to give you a little background and tell you about some of the myths. So first of all, as was mentioned, Elizabeth wrote this book on death and dying that was groundbreaking. You have to think about it like this. Uh, the way that Betty Ford brought the conversation of addiction to the public no one talked about death before. It's, it's shocking for us to think that death wasn't talked about. And one of the pers the people that I had a privilege of working with, um, who also changed things that people often don't think about is Michael Landon, who worked on um, uh, Little House of the Prairie, the actor. Um, he was the first 
person to go on Johnny Carson and actually say he had cancer. I mean, it's hard for us to realize now that 30 years ago, if you had cancer, it was like a secret. It wasn't like today where you hear celebrities and everyone's dealing with cancer in their family. It was a different world. There was actually stigma and shame to something like cancer. And um, we'll talk about how that'll hopefully shift to illnesses of our mind these days. But Kubler-Ross began this amazing conversation, was on, you know, the cover of Life magazine and, you know, had a TV special after the Ed Sullivan show. It was really remarkable, the conversation she had. When I was writing my first book, The Needs of the Dying, um, I was so honored to get to know her and she had just had her stroke. And um, uh, she was just this amazing person to get to meet. And um, a few things that just to give you the background that you might hear is there was one time and Elizabeth was someone who really believed in teaching all the time. And she had been hospitalized at one point and had come home from the hospital and I happened to be there visiting. And there was also a reporter there visiting. And so a home health professional had come and Elizabeth was not someone who bragged about who she was or you walked in the door and you made sure that, you know, she didn't make sure everyone knew who she was and what she did. And so here she is with this home health person there explaining about the IVs and, you know, she's going to be on IV hydration at home for a couple of days after this hospitalization. And um, the nurse at the time says to her, um, do you have an advanced directive? And Kubler-Ross said, yes, of course. And Elizabeth said, would you like to see it? Do you want to know where it is? And the nurse unfortunately said, no, I just have to check a box that you have it. And Elizabeth turned to me and the reporter and said, my work has meant nothing. It was an off the cuff remark and it had gotten, then there was an article about her coming home. It got in the press. And of course the line that went out was, my work meant nothing. And everyone went, oh, Kubler-Ross has denounced her work. No, she had a moment of frustration that she was like, we can't forget the content of looking at the advanced directive, not just saying you have one. So that's an interesting moment in her life that became, people will often go, oh, she denounced it. So we went on to write this book that I love now, Life Lessons, that's really just a great self-help book. And we would always have this ongoing discussion about Elizabeth. People are misusing your stages of death. People don't seem to quite understand them. They're making their littier and they're making them follow like five easy steps to death. And Elizabeth would get so annoyed about the stages because I want you to think about this. Here's this pioneering woman pioneering physician who wrote 26 books, changed the face of death and dying and grief and loss, lobbied and sat with Congress to get hospice to be a real benefit and real profession and palliative care, had done all this and people wanted to reduce her to these five words and it would drive her nuts. And so um, that was always such a challenge for her. But I kept talking about these stages are getting misused and you know people are adapting them for grief and all of that. So years later, uh, I got a call out of the blue and she goes, all right, all right, the stages, like they're driving me crazy. Let's formally adapt them for grief. And so we together worked on a book adapting her stages of um, dying for stages of grief. Now, 
one of the big criticisms you'll hear is you'll hear, oh, those stages were never adapted. Those were never adapted. And I'm always like, yes, they were. And we did the adapting ourselves. So the stages were certainly adapted for grief in our book um, on grief and grieving. So that's one of the myths. The other thing, and let me grab it here. This is up and the books went down and Mother Teresa went down. Let me fix all this. And the other thing I want to share real quick. See, this is definitely live. Um, people are like, is it live? And I'm like, believe me, if it was pre-recorded, that wouldn't have happened. We would do a retake. But anyway, this is the book. And here's what I would just want to tell you. Literally, um, I find this fascinating, the criticisms that people have of, on grief and grieving and about Elizabeth's work, the stages. Um, I always think this is so funny when um, uh, people go, oh, the stages, da, da, da. literally on page one of the book, we made sure on page one, we said, they're not linear. There's no one right way to do grief. There's no map for grief. Everyone does grief their own way. And it's fascinating to me over at these last 20 years since On Grief and Grieving came out to hear those things. And I'll say to people, did you read the book? No. Did you read page one? Because I'll say page one literally agrees with you completely. They're not linear. There's a million stages. There's no one grief model. So it's interesting when you hear all those criticisms that just sort of aren't true in any way. But I do want to just highlight um, uh, these some of these ideas. And uh, let me just share screen again. OK. Here we go here. All right. Oh, and it took me back to the beginning. Well, a quick review. There we go. All right. Let's go here to the five stages were never intended to be prescriptive. They're descriptive, not prescriptive. They're not a route to tuck messy emotions into neat packages. They don't prescribe, they describe, and they only describe a general process and each person grieves in his or her own way. Nonetheless, the grieving process does unfold in these stages often, and people will recognize them. So some of the myths are they're linear. Everyone has to go through these stages. And here's the thing. People often think about, we follow the stages. No, the stages actually reflect where we are. And if you read Kubler-Ross's early works, you'll see like there's many stages. I think there was even six, seven at one point. And she talks about a lot of different stages and how they also work for grief. But here's the amazing thing about her work. And I think why she doesn't sort of often get her due. Elizabeth didn't invent something. She literally observed something that no one else had seen. I think of her as someone who went, I'm noticing the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I'm noticing that people who are dying or their loved ones have died or they're going through changes in their life. I'm noticing they often start with, I can't believe it can't believe this is happening. It's like they have a form of denial. They often get angry. They often bargain. Bargaining before death looks like deal making. After it looks like the what ifs, they get sad. They ultimately find different layers of acceptance. And even to this day, on my Instagram and Facebook, and now shockingly TikTok, Literally, sometimes someone will make a comment. 
you and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross are just trying to get us to follow your grief rules and make us do it your way. And it's not neat like that. And I think, oh my gosh, first of all, neat was a word Elizabeth Kubler-Ross never embodied. No one would have ever called her neat. She was definitely a messy, out of the box person, color out of the box person. And she wasn't a rule follower. She loved being a rule breaker. And here's one of the shocking pieces. Stanford University is now housing all her original research. And when they uh, took over all her papers and research, uh, there was an event that we were all there at Stanford for. And here's what was fascinating about it. They showed an early clip of Elizabeth that I had never seen. And I think about this clip when people go, oh, you've got to like follow her rules. Here's, here's what happened in the clip. In the clip, Elizabeth is on an early TV show, like in the 60s early TV show and there's the host who comes on with a mic and he says today we're going to be talking with Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and it's it's a subject you might want to turn the channel but I'm just that urge to turn the channel well I'm going to let our guests talk about that and Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Elizabeth comes on and the first thing the host says to her, Elizabeth, some people may want to turn the channel and they may not want to hear about death and grief. What would you say to those people? And Elizabeth in her mic says, oh, if you're not comfortable yet, it's okay. We'll see you another time. Bye-bye. Hope you enjoy the other channel. And the host went nuts. And that's who Elizabeth was. She wasn't someone like, learn this now. Do it my way. She's like, ah, if you're not ready, come back another time. Hope you enjoy the other channel. So it was fascinating to see that idea of her work and how she certainly wasn't someone who felt like, wow, we've got to do this. The other thing is acceptance took on a finality that we never intended it to have whether it was originally or us adapting the stages for grief, acceptance wasn't the end of grief. When people say to me, how long is my spouse going to be in grief over the death of a child? How long is my, you know, sister going to miss mom? How long is this grief going to go on? My answer is always, well, how long is the person going to be dead? How long are they going to be dead? Because if they're going to be dead a long time, we're going to grieve a long time. Now, that doesn't mean we will always grieve with pain. Ideally, one of the goals for me is to eventually grieve with more love than pain. And, you know, as much as I talked initially about some of my work and books and all that, I also just want to tell you for a moment sort of my why you know no one wakes up and goes oh i'm in the third grade i want to be a death and grief expert when i grow up how does that happen i had a mother who was in and out of the hospital for years and i just thought mothers go into the hospital every once in a while and then when i was 13 she had to go into this uh hospital hours away for a new procedure that people would vote on the early bioethicists of whether you could get this treatment. And the treatment she needed was dialysis. But it was just at a few hospitals in the country and not everyone got it. And my mother, they voted she could have one dialysis treatment, which we know now would clearly not be enough. So we're in this hospital um, hours away, and um, I, one of the first nurses asked me, how old are you? And I had heard people say, oh, when you're getting close to 18, lie so you can have beer. That was the 
drinking age then. But no one ever told me, oh, you should lie at a hospital. And they said, how old are you? And I went 13, not realizing the age to visit was 14. So here we were at this hospital and I had to spend my time in the lobby and wasn't able to visit my mother. There were a couple of really amazing nurses who once in a while, while would allow me to sneak in and see her. But back then, uh, the family was really thought to be a um, interruption of the healing process. And in the ICU, it was five minutes every two hours you could visit. So one day we're at the hospital across the street. One day when we're at the hospital across the street, uh, people start yelling fire. Everyone rushes out and evacuates and we're standing in front waiting for the all clear. And then we look up and on the 18th floor, flames burst out. And when the flames came out, fire trucks pulled up, they extended their ladders and shooting began. And they realized this was not just a, um, uh, a fire. We had an active shooter on their hand, on our hands. And for me, you can imagine I had been bored in a um, uh, hospital lobby and a hotel lobby. This was like the first sort of action I had seen as a kid. It was the first thing that was sort of interesting finally that was going on. I didn't realize the reality of what it was until police were killed, hotel guests were killed, chief of police was killed. And it really instilled in me at a early age how, you know, good people can choose to be police officers and every day take their lives into their own hands. And that's, I think, what today makes me still serve um, as a reserve specialist with the police from that moment. That shooting went on for 13 hours. It became one of the first mass shootings in the US. And it turned out it was racially motivated. Um, and uh, then my mother died alone. I mean, a lot of this could come out of uh, headlines from today. And so um, that really took me on this trajectory. I felt like I was damaged, ruined, and there was sort of no hope or repair. And um, it wasn't until I got to community college and went to this class on death and dying and heard about this woman, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Now, decades of doing this work and the books and working with people and training therapists over the years um, uh, through PESI here or the psychotherapy networker at their amazing symposium and just all over the world, I knew grief professionally and I certainly knew it from my childhood. But also many of you know, seven years ago, my younger son, David died. Brutal then and brutal now. And I share that for people to understand, I know this work personally and professionally. And one of the things after his death is I wanted to write a note to so many parents I had counseled, as well as many other people, and say to them, I didn't understand how bad the pain was. I had forgotten, I didn't understand, I never knew. So I think for all the clinicians to understand, we can be on the outside helping, but when this horrific pain of loss hits you, it's a very different experience. And I think one of the things we're seeing in lots of research and studies is this idea that grief has a very long shadow. We live in this grief illiterate society that really wants grief to be cleared up in a year. It's like we see the TV and movie kind of death and there's three episodes and then we're done with it and we move on. There's the shock and then we deal with a little pain and then we get back to life. That's how it looks on 
TV and in the movies. And grief has such a long shadow. And we're going to talk about that in a lot of ways. So um, it's it's certainly something that I think just bears repeating often because we often sort of forget some of those aspects. Now, for me, one of the things that happened is after my son died, we canceled all my lectures and um, uh, I was home and I was devastated, obviously. And I think probably a couple of months I was sitting at home and I ran into just going through piles of paper on my desk. And I ran into this chapter that I had written on meaning and grief because meaning didn't seem to connect with people in grief. I had read Viktor Frankl's work, Man's Search for Meaning, and had so much love for his work. And I wondered why it didn't translate. And so I had written this little paper about trying to make that translation. So looked at that and literally I picked it up and I went, yeah, like that's gonna help. And I didn't even read it. Maybe about a month later, I picked it up and began reading it. It didn't take away the pain, but it gave me a cushion. It gave the pain a cushion. And so I began to get curious about this idea of meaning and grief. And as I was dealing with my own grief, I had to do all the things I had told people. And I had to not just be the experiencer, but there was a little grief expert in the back of my mind. And that grief expert would go, yep, you're in denial. You can't believe this happened. Yep, you're angry. Yep, you're sad. Yep, you're depressed. All of that. And I had to do what I had told other people to do for decades. I had to go to a grief counselor. And people go, why would you go to a grief counselor? Because I can't be my own counselor. I can't be the one to help me. I'm in it. And then I had to go to groups. And let me tell you, I am such a believer in groups. And I couldn't force myself to get to a group. It was so hard. And I had often referred to compassionate friends and I wanted to go to compassionate friends, but they were like, no, we're just for bereaved parents. And all of a sudden, oh, I was eligible to go to a group and I did not want to go. And finally, I took my contacts out, put glasses on, put a cap on, and I forced myself to go to a group. And I had to sit in a circle of people with my books five feet away on a table. And I couldn't say, that's me. I'm that grief expert. I had to be the father that buried a child. And that was really hard to sit with that and show up for me. And one of the things I say this to all the clinicians out there, because of that experience these days, when someone shows up to my online groups, when someone tells me they're going to a group, when someone's showing up to their therapist, I like applaud them. I get on a deeper level how hard it is to show up for a group, how hard it is to show up for a therapist, what it took for that client just to walk into your office. So I'm just a huge, huge believer of that. So as I watched my mind go through the emotions, the stages, when I got to this idea, someday I'm gonna to have to accept this, I was like, there's no way. And I thought acceptance can't be all there is. There needs to be more. And I was like, I wonder if that more could be meaning. 
And that's what led me to really explore meaning and those stages to really sort of understand the more and how to, to, um, to know that, to really sort of know that. I wanted to figure out, and I often say, even though I've added the sixth stage, I have not added some mandatory stop along the lines. So I certainly don't mean it that way. Um, and when we talk about meaning making, here's the thing that I want you to know about this. Um, and let me get my little slide show up. I know you have the slides, but I also um, uh, want to show them here in case you don't have them. All right. Let me bring them up once more. All right. I want to make sure I'm doing it from the most recent slide. All right, here we go again. Slideshow, current slide. Let me share. Okay. So when we're talking about making meaning, we are talking about post-traumatic growth. And that can do changes in our identity. That can be changes in our relationship with others. It can change our outlook on life. We cannot just go through what we're experiencing, but actually grow through it. And what does meaning look like? It can be a lot of things. It can be finding gratitude for the time you had with a loved one finding a way to commemorate their life, the laws. Maybe it's realizing the brevity and the value of life and making that a springboard to some kind of major shift. Maybe it's feeling changed by knowing them in life, feeling changed by their death, creating something of meaning for others. When we talk about this, I often give people these guidelines. It's important to, if there's anything for you to understand. And after we talk about meaning, we're gonna dive into how to excavate the pain to find the meaning. To understand meaning is relative and personal. Two, meaning takes time. We may not find it until years after the loss. Meaning doesn't equal understanding. You know, we'll never understand why a loved one has died. And even through meaning, when we can find meaning, it is still not worth the cost. And this is, I think, the biggest one to understand. Meaning does not negate loss. Your loss is not a test, a lesson, something to handle, a gift or a blessing. Loss is what happens in life. And only you can find your own meaning and meaningful connections can replace painful memories. So I think that's so, so important to understand that. And like I said, the rest of the day, we're going to talk about tools and techniques to excavate the pain. If I had one thing to do over around the book, people look at finding meaning and go, oh, I'm not there yet. Finding meaning is the process of excavating the pain. It is revealed underneath. So when I just talked about those guidelines that are in finding meaning, I think about maybe the, the woman who started mad, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She started that organization after her daughter died. She will never understand why her daughter had to die. And she may know she has saved thousands, if not millions of lives with that organization. And she still would rather have her daughter back. It will never be worth the cost. So, you know, and we don't want to like bright side anyone with toxic positivity and like, let's get you to the meaning. Absolutely not. Meaning gets revealed 
as we work through the pain. It's not anything we can just go and find. So keep that in mind. It's so important to not rush anyone or ever make meaning the goal, right? That's definitely not the goal. And here's the other thing. Most of us, we think about the large scale meaning. We think about, oh, are you going to start a foundation? Are you going to get a 5K run named after your loved one? Are you going to do a charity? What are you going to do for meaning? Here's the thing. Meaning is not found on the grand scales. That's the ones we hear about, but meaning is found in the moments. Let me I'll give you a small example of that. A woman, Marcy, had grown up and years ago, her and her dad, she's now in her 50s, 60s, her and her dad had gathered at the TV every whatever it was Tuesday night and watched together her dad's favorite show, which was the Danny Thomas show. And Danny Thomas's daughter went on to become Marlo Thomas and they run St. Jude's, really an amazing, amazing organization. And she had these fond, fond memories of her father, who was now long deceased. She goes to the post office one day to buy stamps. And she goes to buy stamps, and she's just trying to get in and out. And the post office worker goes, do you, do you want flag? And puts the book out and starts, to, do you want flags? Do you want flowers? Do you? And she's like, oh my gosh, thinking, I just need some forever stamps. Let me get them and go. And she just is flipping as a courtesy since the postal worker gave her all these options and put the book there. She's like, I'll just pretend like I'm choosing one. And then all of a sudden she sees a Danny Thomas stamp and she suddenly gets whisked back to her childhood and she buys those stamps. Now, she didn't take them home and frame them or do anything special with them. She used them as stamps. And now when she's just mailing a letter or a bill or something, she grabs one of those stamps she finds this sweet meaning that comes to her. And so I want you to think about meaning is found in the moments. Meaning is found in the moments, not in the grand gestures. So really think that through. Meaning is found in the moments, not in the grand gestures. Because we often want to think of it that way. And so as we look at this idea, of what, how does it play out in our life? One of the things is sometimes when people tell me, and you just have to look on my Facebook in the comments, people will write, I can never find meaning. I will never find meaning. And they're like directing their future. There can be no meaning found. Early on, of course, we don't think about meaning. But in time, as we move into the years of grief, people can have a hard time grieving if they've pre-decided there's nothing meaningful that can be. Now, I think one of the biggest myths people have about meaning is that the meaning is in the death. And that's so not true. There's no meaning in your loved one's death. There's no meaning in a horrible cancer. There's no meaning in a death by COVID. There's no meaning in a murder. There's no meaning in a parent's or siblings or child's death or spouse's death. There's no meaning there. Meaning is in us. It's what we do afterward. It's what we do afterwards. And the challenge is if we remain stuck or stagnant in one place, and we're going to talk a lot about this today. We can become dedicated to the loss and make the loss the focus of our life to the point where we lose all sense of purpose and direction. So when I think about this idea of what's the goal of grief work, 
I think about the goal of grief work in this way. We knew how to love them when they were here. We knew how to love them when they were here. We have to figure out who we are now without them. So the first goal is to figure out who we are now without them. And the second goal that people find a little unusual is we have to establish a new relationship with them. We knew how to love them when they were here, but we have to learn how to love them in their absence. And boy, that's a huge challenge. So when we think about this idea of um, uh, loving them in their absence, I think about time. There's no timeline in grief. I know you know that. There's no timeline in grief. But I want to talk about some markers just for us to sort of understand where people might be on their particular journey. So here's what this, here's how I see it. There's what Elizabeth and I in on grief and grieving back in 2000 called anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief is the grief that happens before the death. Even in Elizabeth's first work, she used to call it preparatory grief. We're preparing for the death. Pre preparatory grief, anticipatory grief, that's the place where people often may be when the loved one is still alive. Whenever people come to me and say, how do I handle my loved one's illness if they're dying? I always say, you have to allow yourself the anticipatory grief and don't attend the funeral early. Don't attend the funeral early. There's still life. There's still the person there with you. So you want to make sure you are still present for that. So there's this, what we call anticipatory grief. Then the death happens. When the death happens, we then go into what I call acute grief. Acute grief is just happened. There's nothing but pain. There's nothing but grief. You're in this horrendous fog. You cannot, you're trying to figure out how to do life still. And it's just horrendous, overwhelming, ever present. That acute grief can last, and it's such a range for people. It can be anywhere from a week to nine months to 10 months. Now, I don't ever know when acute grief is, except it's there in the beginning, but I can tell you how to sort of notice when folks are beginning to come out of that acute part of grief, they begin to say things like, oh, I'm just beginning to catch my breath. Oh, just beginning to feel my feet on the ground again. There is a sense of um, holding, holding back, holding back that you're, you're, you're at least not in a free fall. You're at least not in a free fall and that holding back sort of like, okay, I can, I can find some agency a little in my life, just a little agency. Now, what we go to next is um, uh, the, um, uh, what I call early grief. Now, I want you to think about this. If I went to the local mall, the local downtown area, and I just randomly said to people, when is early grief? When is early grief? People would say, I don't know. Is it the first month? Is it the first three months? Is it the first week? Is it the first year? I think of early grief on an average as around two years. So you'll have so many clients that are going to be like, I don't know why I'm still in grief at a year or a year and a half. 
they're not only still in grief, they're in early grief. They're in early grief, just to understand that. And then from there, I think of us as going more into mature grief for the rest of our lives. Now, it doesn't mean, as I mentioned, we will always be in pain. Ultimately, we will grieve with love. Ultimately, we would grieve with love. But that takes time, obviously. That takes a lot of time. So keep that in mind. Um, and as we talk about this idea of uh, the grief and the timeline, which we just always got to remember, there is no timeline, right? So, but be aware, if there's something I'll often do when someone asks me a question about their grief, I will say, when did it happen? Only because I want to place them. Are they in anticipatory grief, acute grief, early grief, more mature grief? One of the things that I find so remarkable is we were talking a lot of clinicians were together and we were talking about when the average person seems to show up for grief work to a counselor, like walks in and goes, I think I got some grief I got to look at. I think I got some grief I haven't dealt with. You know when that usually is? Five years. I want you to think about that. They've been dealing with it in the background for five years. So I think, like I said, grief has such a longer shadow than we think about it having. It's really around for a much, much longer period of time than we ever, ever believe, right? Now, let's sort of dive in to some thoughts on this grief. So first of all, grief is different than other things. Let me give you an example of this. A few years ago, I was lucky enough, and I mean lucky enough, to get two stints put in my heart. After the two stints got put in my heart, People are put on beta blockers to slow their heart down, to just relieve some of the pressure. And with that relief, there's often drugs people take like atenolol. Here's the thing about atenolol, and there's many other drugs that they use. But no matter which of us took a drug like atenolol, a beta blocker, it's going to slow our heart down. It's going to, you know, take it down five beats a minute. It will take sort of the pressure off the heart. And atenolol works on everyone. It sort of doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't take into account your belief about it, whether you think it's going to work or not work. Atenolol just works. It lowers your heart rate. On the other hand, grief is not like that. Grief takes your assumptions and beliefs into account. We all don't grieve exactly alike. Our assumptions go into grief. Do you believe grief is for weakness, a sign of weakness? Do you believe crying needs to get shut down? Do you believe you need to be strong? It's fascinating to me to think about all these uh, griefs that there are. And um, when we talk about these griefs, um, I think about um, uh, how were someone raised? You know, it's interesting to really talk to the person about what's their loss history. How did they learn about grief? 
how did their family grieve? I'll tell you, for me, how I learned about grief, two things. I remember my mother answering the phone when I was young, on the phone, bursting into tears. You heard my father yell, what? And my mother falling to the floor with the phone in her hand, saying my mother died. My father hung up the phone, lifted my mother up, took her to the bedroom, never mentioned again. That's my first experience with grief. My second experience with grief was Gilligan's Island. Mr. Howell had disappeared. They assumed he had died and they had a funeral on Gilligan's Island. I saw what a funeral looks like. I was taught about a funeral from Gilligan's Island. That was my lost history before that was my history with grief. Now, here's the thing. When I have my grief history, any spouse or partner I'm with is going to have a different grief history. So our history is shaped by how did our family do grief? Was it a long grieving period? Was it a period of denial? Was it grief about being productive? Was grief about you go to the funeral and then you're done? How did our family handle grief? And then we usually have our religion. How did our religion handle grief? Were we supposed to be happy? They're in heaven now. Were we supposed to be horribly sad? What did our religion say about it? One of the things I will never forget is when I was at um, Loyola Marymount University working on my bioethics degree, I literally was in this class where we had to pick a religion that we were least familiar with. So we had to pick a religion unlike ours, unlike one we knew about, and we had to study its beliefs on illness, death, and grief. We would study them, we would present them in a paper from the written scripture, from what was there, we presented in the first quarter. Then we would be assigned to an actual patient in the hospital who had that religion. And we would follow them. At the end of the semester, we'd all do our presentation. And across the board, we all said the same thing to the professor. And he told us, he hears this every semester. We said, um, my patient didn't follow their religion exactly as they were supposed to and he talked about how really to think about that our beliefs there's not even one catholicism your catholicism was individually shaped by your priest by your parents and it was customized in the house that you grew up your christianity was customized your Judaism was customized by the rabbi, by your family. Like no two people, even when you look at them religious or spirituality, their spirituality, see the same religions. Even there's different atheists. So think about that. We all bring all these different beliefs around grief. And I think we have this myth about there's one way we grieve. And I always say, if I have seen one person in grief, I've only seen one person in grief because everyone's going to do it differently. Every single person is going to always do grief differently. And grief is not like a tenal that our thoughts and assumptions don't matter. Our thoughts or assumptions, our beliefs, our religions, all customize our grief. They all give us permissions, prisons. They give us all those things, right? So think about that. Um, it's so important to understand how all these griefs are shaped so differently.
Okay, so when we look at this and we go back and look at how all this is shaped, our grief is not objective, it's not like a medication. And thinking itself is meaning making. Thinking itself is meaning making. We don't have a neutral thought. We don't have a neutral thought. Every thought reinforces a meaningful or meaningless existence. I often think about this. If I was talking to someone who had never seen a pencil and I showed them a pencil and I said, this is a pencil, what do you think it is? They might look at a pencil and go, is it, is it a weapon of some sort? Or they might go, well, I don't know, it's a piece of wood with a little black center in it. And we're taught that that pencil can do writing. We're taught that that pencil could solve math problems. We're taught that that pencil could write amazing pieces of literature. Same with a pen. So think about, and now with computers, so think about everything we have in our world gets assigned a meaning on some level, gets assigned a meaning on some level. And so when we're talking about this, just know meaning is really in everything. I want to talk to you for a moment about hope. Hope has a close relationship with meaning. Now, here's the thing to know about this. Sometimes when I work with someone and the concept of hope comes up, they may go, oh my God, there is, hope is not a possibility. And we'll be talking and I'll say, it sounds like your hope, you're feeling like, your hope died with your loved one. And they'll surprisingly perk up and say, yes, that's it. Yes, that's it. Because they feel witnessed. And I'll say, here's the tragedy. Your loved one's death, their physical death is permanent. That is permanent and it is so heartbreaking. And I believe your loss of hope is temporary. Your death is permanent, but your loss of hope is temporary. And by the way, until you can find your hope again in your own time, I'm going to hold it for you. I may have hope for you. And I don't want to invalidate where they are, but I want to hold hope out here that it still exists because I don't want to give death any more power than it already has. You know, death has the power to end a life, but not our relationship and not our love. And I think it's confusing to people. People think about this concept that when my loved one died, and then I'm going to talk about non-death grief real quickly here for a moment. But people think about, oh my gosh, you know, I can't love them anymore. They died. I don't believe that for a moment. We're going to talk a little bit more today about continuing bonds. But I got to tell you, when my younger son died, I haven't stopped loving him. I love him every day. I especially loved him intensely, daily, every day when it initially happened. I absolutely love him every day. And I still believe that he loves me from wherever he may be. So I'm not a believer that love dies and to not give death more power than it has. I also want to mention, especially for people who may be watching and thinking about other types of grief. Here's my take. I believe all grief is a death. Let me explain here. 
I think a breakup is the death of a romantic relationship. I believe a divorce is a death of a marriage. I believe a job loss is the death of that paycheck with those people in that place. So keep that in mind is it's always a death of something. Now, as we frame this, here's what I really want you to know about this. And it was like the best symbolism of this I saw. So I want you to imagine during the pandemic, like week three, week two, maybe. We're in our homes, stay in. We don't know what's going on. A friend of mine comes over. We meet middle of the street, best friend for years, meet middle of the street, walking probably eight feet apart. We're walking outside, trying not to get this mysterious new thing that there is in the world in this pandemic. As we're walking and just trying to have a little socialization, a young girl comes up, stands six feet from me in tears. She says, David, I, I'm a neighbor. I've met you a couple of times. My, my wedding just got postponed and she's in tears. And she's just like, I hear you know about grief. I don't know how I'm going to live through this. This is horrible. And I talked to her about her grief of her wedding being postponed. We talked for a while. After we chat, she thanks me, goes back to her house. My friend I'm walking with goes, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened. And I went, what? Why? And he goes, she's talking to you about a wedding being postponed as grief? She goes, your son David died. That's grief, not a wedding being postponed. I can't believe she was going on and on about her wedding. And I had to say to my friend, hey, 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 you don't understand grief, my friend. Here's the thing, and this is what I explained to him. I said, first of all, that 20-year-old girl has not had a death. Her worst grief is a postponed wedding. That is the worst thing that has ever happened to her. Thank goodness. That's her worst grief. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Grief is not like a pie that she took a piece for her postponed wedding and now I got less grief. No, there's room in this world for all our losses. There's room for all the breakup tears, for all the divorce tears, for all the death tears, for all the disappointments. To understand one grief doesn't take away from another. And here's a big thing I need you to know clinically. Is let's say you're running a group. Let's say you're running a group. And if you're running a group, one of the big things to think about, you're in this group and someone says, and I'll tell you, it can take a million forms, especially if you have a mixed group. But let's say someone says they're there in the group because their fiance died and they known each other for two years and they were getting married and this was their dream happening. And the person next to them pipes in four minutes into the share and goes, excuse me, that's not real grief. My husband died after 45 years. That's real grief. Two years is nothing. So few things to think about in those scenarios. Number one, going back to my friend, I said to him, not only grief 
is not like a limited pie that people take some of it. I also said, when anyone asks me, what's the worst grief? Is it, is it a murder? Is it a child dying? Is it a parent you've had, they've been here, they've been on this earth for a hundred years. Is it your twin sibling? Like, what's the worst grief? Is it your child? Is it your dog? What's the worst grief? I always say the worst grief is yours. The worst grief is always your grief. That's the worst grief. So just keep that in mind. Now, I also talk about when we're comparing griefs, we are, and this is true for trauma and everything, when we are comparing grief, we are not in our heart, we are in our mind. And we don't have a broken mind, we have a broken heart. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, going back to that group scenario, you might think when the woman says, that's not grief, da da da. Of course, you can say to her, we're not comparing griefs here. Everyone's grief is valid. Everyone gets to have their own grief. But clinically, I want you to be aware of this. The woman who's going, my husband's been gone 50 years. How dare you go on and on about your fiance? Is saying to you, my grief has not been seen enough. My grief has not been witnessed enough. And I'm afraid she's taking some of the grief that I need, witnessing that I need, and using it on her fiance. So as much as in a group setting, you may want to go, oh, you know, let's go over the rules that we don't judge each other's grief. You also got to recognize, and I know a lot of you here are moderators from my own grief groups, and they see this all the time you have to understand that they're telling you their grief has not been witnessed enough. Their grief has not been seen enough. And that is so, so important to understand that. One of the other things that I think, and this has been a, a, a meme of mine that's like happened or a graphic, is we believe our work is to make our grief smaller. Your grief doesn't get smaller. We have to become bigger. We have to grow around the grief. You know, if I was to describe what, how I would describe my grief to people, what I went through, when my son died, my grief was like here. I, I literally couldn't see what was in front of me. Like everything was my grief. In time, my grief would sort of move down here. And I could begin to just even see the world again. And then my grief would move here. And then it eventually moves here. And it will reside right here for the rest of my life. And like I said, there'll be times, oh, I might bump into it, something may touch it, and it takes me right back. But this idea that we're going to make this grief tiny, no, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. The other thing to give you context, and like, and then this afternoon, and we're going into really practical tools and techniques to use with your clients, I want to really think about <clears throat> this idea of how we hold grief. And in the last book, Finding Meaning, I did something I never thought I'd do as a grief specialist. I studied buffaloes. I studied buffaloes. And here's what we know about buffaloes. Buffaloes sense a storm coming, and they run into the storm, thereby minimizing the time they're in pain. I want you to think about it. We are often not like buffaloes. We touch upon our grief, and many 
of us, many of our clients, put the grief right behind them and it follows them for the rest of their lives. And they make decisions from it and they live from it. So part of the work is for us to interact and engage with the grief rather than keeping it behind us in the background where it's just this gentle river that sort of is this river of misery that sort of we deal with all the time. To sort of walk with clients and help them feel safe in engaging, in engaging this painful thing. Now, I often, you know, have heard people say, Oh, yeah, you know, grief, but gosh, you know, it, it's so painful. It's like touching a hot stove. And I'll go, no, no, no. It's not like touching a hot stove. The hot stove has fallen on you. The hot stove has fallen on you. And there's so much that comes with that that we're going to unpack a lot of that this afternoon. I also want to say at times, we'll talk about trauma and how trauma interacts and i want you to think about this all grief does not have trauma but all trauma has grief all trauma has grief and many times we have to tackle both of it so to think about this you could have like my father died when he was 84 years old. He had had a long life. He felt ready to die. He died in my home. It was a peaceful, peaceful completion of his life. That was pure grief. There was no trauma in it. There's other people who their, died, their dad could have died at 84 in a traumatic way. So there's grief and there's trauma. And then we also have the trauma that can get projected onto the grief. We'll talk about that later too. The idea that like, I will see the grief through my trauma. And of course you will. How could you not? How could you not? You know, and when we talk about all trauma has grief, if someone was raped, they have that horrible traumatic event, trauma that follows, and often don't know about the grief, that they have to grieve that loss of innocence, maybe the loss of safety in the world, maybe the loss of um, uh, thinking intimate relationships can be um safe so many of those griefs that are in trauma so it's really important to think about them that's why we have so much to cover i am excited about you being here we are going to um head into a break here in just a moment and we'll all take a break and then i'll come back and i'm going to answer some questions from this morning and so just know so much is still coming. Try, if you can, to think of your questions for what I already explained so that I don't have to go, oh, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up. Anyway, it's going to be a full day, and I'm so excited, and we're just getting started. So thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to head into our break now for about uh, 15 minutes. So there we go into our break. <laughs> 